via telephone, Jason Huffman, State Director for Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia Branch. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Hey, good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Well, the pleasure is always ours, my man. What have you been up to these days? Oh, you know, just staying busy. Um, really, number one priority for us is electing a governor. We've talked about that. Yes, indeed. So we've, uh, we've I think, uh, knocked on 100,000 doors across the state so far. So we've been busy. Who are you trying to get elected? Remind me. Patrick Morrissey. Patrick Morrissey is uh, by far head and shoulders above the, the competition in terms of his leadership and what he's demonstrated and how he's led as attorney general. And so we're really excited. And, and the feedback that we're getting from West Virginians is that they're excited, too. We had in the first hour, Mac Warner on in the first half hour. And then the last half hour was Patrick Morrissey. And it strikes me that they both have great resumes. In fact, uh, most of the candidates running for governor have pretty good resumes. And uh, I think also fairly good name recognition as well, Jason. So when, when you looked at all the candidates, and I know this isn't specifically the topic we were going to uh, discuss today, but when you when you looked at all of those, how did you differentiate and separate from the resumes? Well, I think uh, obviously when it comes to making an endorsement at that level, um, we, we put a lot of thought into it, and, and we set a high bar uh, for the candidates that we endorse. And really, Patrick Morrissey is the guy that, as attorney general, uh, has just had some of the most landmark wins, um, really, that, that have affected not only West Virginia's prosperity, but that of the nation. You know, if you look at West Virginia v. EPA, uh, he went to the Supreme Court and won that case on behalf of West Virginians. Uh, and really what that's going to do is make the administrative state in Washington take a step back uh, and make Congress step up and do their jobs and, and really tell the administration, um, you know, here is the letter of the law. You can't color outside of the lines. And that's vastly, vastly important uh, as we continue to see the sort of rogue bureaucracy kind of color outside of the lines and, and really uh, take a little bit too much power away from, from both Congress and from people. You know, he also here in the Eastern Panhandle and something that affected us uh, around here, uh, fought uh, the state of Maryland to allow West Virginia to take more water out of the Potomac River. Something that's got I yeah, think, waters of the United States rule was a was another huge win, and it, it, you can go down the list, right? Um, stopping Obama's clean power plan, it, the guy has just won and won and won for West Virginia, and he's unafraid to take on the powerful special interests to get that done. And we think that's the kind of leadership we need in the governor's office. So that's why we've uh, we've been, you know, out there. Uh, pushing pavement and talking to folks at the door, and that's what we do. That's our, our comparative advantage, if you will, Rob, uh, to, to really connect with people at their doorstep where they're at and, and have the conversation. Now, you've also made some endorsements in regards to Senate races here in the Eastern Panhandle. We have indeed. It's our first round of, uh, of state legislative endorsements. Yesterday, uh, we endorsed uh, Senator Patricia Rucker and uh, Senate President Craig Blair, and really – I mean, you know, again, uh, when you think about folks who have really, really worked hard to drive policy solutions in the state, uh, those those folks immediately come to mind. You know, and when we when we think about candidates for office uh, as an organization, we know that there are special interests out there that want to stop us from having policies that help people thrive, because in a lot of facets. Um, Special interests have set up a system that's rigged in their favor, okay? Um, and the average person um, doesn't have that power that, to hire a lobbyist and go to Charleston for them. Uh, and you, you rely as citizens on principled policy leaders who are going to stand up for policy that we, we know is, is there to proven to help people thrive, uh, not help a special interest have a, a advantage, and so these are two folks that, you know, they, they have demonstrated time and again that they're, they're willing to do that. You know, take, for example, um, the Hope Scholarship, right? Groundbreaking reform that does not happen without the work of, of Senator Rucker and President Blair. I mean, when that law was first adopted, you know, West Virginia was the first state in the nation to have a truly universal education freedom policy. And, and since then, you know, many other states have adopted a similar policy. Um, so you're talking about two leaders in Senator Rucker and Senator Blair that not only have they made sure that 6,000 families in this state have access to the education that, that best suits their unique needs, but they have moved the needle across the country and kind of set an example for other states where they can step up and say, you know, 
it can be done. We, we can do something this transformational, and, and they made it happen. So that, uh, that is one of the major reasons that you know, we've endorsed these folks and are happy, proud to support their reelection bids. I hate to play the either-or game with you on this one, but I, I must. Uh, so, obviously, Delegate Paul Espinosa, Speaker Pro Tem, a long and uh, accomplished career in the House of Delegates, has decided to run for Senate and challenge Senator Rucker. And in the publicity photo that was sent out, I see Delegate Espinosa at his uh, signature uh, table, standing beside Senate President Craig Blair, who has a big smile on his face, which I presume means that this would be his preferred candidate. Uh, were you aware of that when you endorsed Senator Rucker, or does does it not matter at all uh, how Senator Blair feels about Delegate Espinosa? Uh, I think when it comes to, we'll call it factions, okay? Uh, our organization takes a position where we put principles over factions. And so when we see a principled policy champion who has stepped up in a big way, um, like Senator Rucker has, I mean, you know, Rob, she was, she was the architect of the nation's first universal education freedom bill. Um, Senate President Blair was the guy that helped. Uh, he was the first Senate president in the nation to, to make that a key policy priority and, and marshal his caucus through that legislative process. So, you know, when it comes to transformational policy wins, that bill, for instance, doesn't happen without those two working closely together. Um, and that's the, the reality for the 6,000 families that are now enrolled in Hope Scholarship. Without the work of those two and working closely together, they don't have access to the education that's right for them. And so when it comes to uh, the, the politics of the situation, um, we're, we're kind of agnostic to that. Uh, we look at policy champions on an individual basis, and these are two individuals that, that have stepped up in a big way for West Virginians, and that's why they got our endorsement. John Gilstrap. Hey, Jason. <clears throat> when you talk about um, principle over factions, what what do you mean by factions? Well, I think, uh, obviously, when you have a legislative uh, agenda, when you have a legislative body, there are folks that, that are closer with each other than, than not. Um, obviously, uh, it's... We'll put it. We'll put it in simple terms. Families fight sometimes, right? They have disagreements, and when you have passionate people, um, and they are tasked with not only representing their constituents uh, as best they can, but but really trying to accomplish things that will transform the state, that's a lot of pressure. And uh, just like families, time heals all wounds, and, and sometimes folks have disagreements. Uh, I know that there are often disagreements in the legislative process, and so that's that's what I'm referencing. So you said you, you've you been knocking on a lot of doors. Um, does the door knocking lead give you an idea of what the, the candidate that the electorate wants and therefore that drives you to endorse a candidate? Or is the door knocking after you have selected which candidate to endorse to go and, um, and, and ring the bell on their behalf? I'd, I'd say much more of the latter, right? So our, our process is, is essentially... Um, is there a policy champion in the race, and can we have an impact? And so that is a, a lot of the, the vetting mindset that goes into this, along with the accomplishments. I mean, it, it, it for a lot of organizations, you can get their endorsement better than that voting record. For Americans for Prosperity, we set the bar way higher. You, you have to be a leader uh, either on the forefront or behind the scenes in a meaningful way, driving progress toward, toward transformational policy wins. Um, and so, you know, for example, the, the case of, of, you know, Patrick Morrissey for governor or uh, Patricia Rucker for state Senate, President Blair for state Senate, um, those are individuals that, that meet that criteria. And so, you know, we vet them based upon their voting record, uh, based upon their decorum in terms of the level of civility that they have. Are they uniting people uh, around ideas? Or are they being divisive? Because um, that's, a, that's a big thing for us. Uh, we want folks that are going to be able to unite people. Uh, we think that you know, politics of today is a, a bit too tribalistic, a bit too divisive. Um, too, you know, we look at people that are going to folks that are divided. Jason, we're, we're starting to lose your cell a little bit, Jason. Oh, you still sorry there? About that. Yeah, okay, you're back. Okay. Where'd you lose me? Uh, about halfway through your last sentence. Okay. So. The point I was making was essentially um, we want a better decorum in politics. We find it to be too vitriolic, uh, too much tribalism, and, and 
again, the folks that we've endorsed, um, they are folks that are uniters. They bring people together around policy solutions we know are, are proven to help people thrive. And when we make that decision to endorse, again, we've set a high bar, and that's when we set to work to, to talk to citizens to make sure that they're aware um, and, and read in on the great work that these individuals are, are doing um, to better the lives of West Virginians. And what's the practical um, result of being endorsed? Is it a plug of money? Is, is it what happens after an endorsement? Well, we have um, you know activists all across the state. We have staff all across the state uh, that are connecting with people. And I think that is at the door one of the most impactful things that you can do. Um, not a lot of folks, I think, have the bandwidth or um, wherewithal, frankly, to go out and knock doors in December like, like our activists do, right? Uh, but it is the most impactful thing that you can do um, to connect folks with, with the ideas uh, around these, these, these policy champions. And so uh, we knock doors, we do direct mail, we do digital marketing, uh, and those things all combine to, to represent what we think is a, a, a real difference-making approach uh, to electoral politics in the state. Anytime that, you know, you can connect with the grassroots in a meaningful way, meet them where they're at, uh, go to their doorstep and have a conversation, it's truly an impactful thing. Um, us being able to have that conversation, I think, is, is the real difference maker and, and what probably differentiates our endorsements from, from that of other folks. One of the elements of politics in recent years that I have found particularly uh, off-putting is the amount of negative advertising, negative campaigning, and the complete dearth of positive plans for the future that, that seems to just have disappeared from, the, you talk about divisive politics. So in the case where we have um, Delegate Espinoza uh, versus uh, uh, Senator Rucker going for the, for the same uh, slot, does this ultimately translate into negative campaigning against uh, Delegate es Espinoza and by extension, I guess, against Secretary Warner and such the, for the, the non-endorsed um, uh, candidates? Are you talking about from, from Americans for Prosperity or as a general thing? Well, you're going to be involved in that process, right? I mean, the, you're, you're part of that overall campaigning process. Sure. Well, I, I can't speak for other organizations. However, I will say that our approach to politics is very much one that is not divisive. Uh, we try to keep things based upon the issues, uh, based upon the agenda items that we know from a policy perspective are going to help people have a better place to live, work, and raise a family in the state. And so I think it is important to, to differentiate that approach from others because it's entirely possible to say someone has had a bad voting record and say that they're not you know, a bad person as a result of that. And that gets lost a lot, I think, uh, in, in modern politics. So um, you will not see, a, 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 you know, a quote-unquote attack ad from us. Uh, what you might see is a, a little bit of a contrast in terms of voting records. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, um, I, I would say that when it comes to our endorsement and the way that we approach the political landscape, Probably a lot different than, than a lot of other folks. And have you all um, decided who to endorse for the uh, senatorial seat at the national? You know, we're, we're looking at uh, the map across the board, really, uh, with the filing deadline coming up uh, at the end of this month. You know, we're, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the other elections happening across the state uh, and really, you know, key into some, some key inflection points where we think that we could make an impact uh, and, and drive policy outcomes in a, in a better way. But we haven't made a decision on that one at this current time. Jason, AFP National endorsed Nikki Haley for president. I remember when that came out, I thought that was interesting. What were your thoughts on that? Well, so Americans for Prosperity Action, uh, which is which is a sister organization to ours, uh, has endorsed Nikki Haley for president. And that's because uh, she has uh, the credentials to become president of the United States. She's someone that we believe is going to help us turn the page um, in this sort of uh, us versus them, uh, I think, landscape. You know, I think Americans generally, they're, they're ready to move on from candidates from the past. Um, that includes Donald Trump. And so uh, my standpoint is essentially uh, Donald Trump could not beat Joe Biden when he was the incumbent. He probably doesn't have a very good shot now. Republicans would be better off to pick someone else 
to run in the general because we know that Donald Trump cannot win. Let's talk and about that. Is why we've been, that's to... why we've endorsed Nikki Haley because her record is uh, is one that is impressive. She's an extremely principled woman, and we think that she'd make an excellent nominee for president of the United States. What are you looking for in this sixty day legislative session, Jason? You know that's an interesting question, Rob, because based on the environment. Um, I, I think it's just going to be a relatively quiet legislative session. When it comes to policy, anytime you have uncertainty, the, the level of risk aversion in policymakers increases. Uh, so obviously, it, you know, it's an election year. Half of the state Senate is running for reelection. All the House of Delegates members are running for reelection. Uh, the public board of works is up, and, and some state legislators are running for higher office in those seats. So you know, it's unclear for policymakers who might be implementing any reforms they, they could make this year. Uh, so as a general rule, election years tend to, to kind of increase the level of risk aversion that policymakers have. And I, I think it's probably important to highlight this is only the second lame duck session, uh, you know, legislative term of art there, where, where you have a, a term limited governor who's moving on uh, that Republicans have, have faced in the majority. Uh, so it kind of makes the, the session an anomaly from, from the standpoint of governance, but it's, it's equally important to remember that lawmakers have just accomplished a tremendous amount uh, in a really short period of time. You know, whether it's you know, the enactment of, of historic tax cuts last session, um, whether it is you know, a constant grind to cut needless red tape that, that stand in the way of innovation and growth, or you know, as we've talked about just recently here, uh, the enactment of the, the nation's first universal education freedom bill. I mean, they've just done a lot of reforms that are that are quickly increasing prosperity in the state. And so I think they've they sown a lot of seeds and they're kind of watching them bear fruit right now. Are you endorsing or hoping for any additional changes to the Hope Scholarship this term? Uh, I think that there will be legislation that, that takes a look at cleaning up elements of it. But, you know, it's, a, it's an extremely well-functioning program as it is. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, indicative and evidenced by the 6,000 families that, that have enrolled in it. Uh, but there's always more that we can do on the education front. And I think, you know, this would be a great session for lawmakers to begin to look at how we can deregulate the traditional public school system and, and really untie the hands of educators uh, so that they can have more freedom to, to individualize children's education in, in the traditional system. There's just a lot of red tape and a lot of heavy-handed bureaucracy that's top-down that we think is holding the individual educator back um, um, from really, you know, making sure that kids have have the right education pathway for them in the traditional system. So I think it's it's a great time to take a look at that for state lawmakers. Were you pleased with the way the state income tax cut was set up, Jason, in that it's not really subject to legislators' votes now. It's a mathematical problem, and if it meets all the criteria, it kicks in. Yeah, anytime that you can, you can, you know, instill in a piece of legislation triggers that are based on the economic outlook of the state, um, it it allows us to have a very empirically based approach, a data based approach to further tax cuts, right? So the, the triggers that are there um, essentially over time will get us to a, a, a phase out in total of the income tax. And we think that's incredible for a couple of reasons. But the main thing is essentially we know that reducing tax rates, allowing workers to keep more, more of their hard earned paychecks, uh, it allows folks to invest in their version of the American dream, but, but it also uh, it drives people to the state. Uh, and drives investment in the state, GDP growth. And so we know that uh, is a proven policy to help people thrive. And uh, so we're happy to see that there are, you know, there's not going to be additional legislative action needed in order to continue to reduce that rate. Before the election cycle is completed, will AFP West Virginia endorse a candidate from every race around the state? You know, I don't, I don't anticipate us doing that. Um, we tend to look at things in a more uh, case-by-case basis. Um, there's a lot of organizations that that'll put out, you know, a big slate of candidates, and then they don't actually do anything to help them get elected. Uh, we we prefer not to act like that. And so, when we endorse a policy champion, it's somebody that, again, 
is a is a leader, somebody that has led on the issues in a meaningful way. Um, and not all lawmakers are created equal in that regard, Rob. And so I would not anticipate us endorsing uh, everybody uh, in in every seat. So essentially. Uh, what I'm saying is that we we pick and choose based on the level of, of contribution that that person has had toward transformational policy, and uh, that's that's really a big part of the decision driver for us. Jason, any uh, way our listeners can find out more about Americans for Prosperity? Yeah, I would take a look at AmericansforProsperity.com. Um, you probably see us on on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. If you if you have the the latter one, latter two. Um, although I find Twitter. Is mostly where politicians and journalists hang out, and and operatives like me. And so, uh, <laughs> operatives, yes, yeah. You look like an operative in the you photo do. we have up there. Yeah, James I'm trying Bond. to figure out where the pistol is hidden under that tuxedo jacket. <laughs> Huffman, Jason Huffman. Well, it's it's the wedding photo, Jason. Oh, yeah. uh, it's my Leo DiCaprio photo. Oh yeah, Great. absolutely. It's the one okay, we use all the works. time. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, good to talk with you again, man. Any final thoughts? No, sir. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Jason Upman, State Director of Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia. Uh, Bob Denver, by the way, born this date, 1935. He died in the year 2005 at the age of uh, 70. A little Gilligan's Island theme in the background as we take it to the break.